right. Welcome to this, our fourth webinar in a series on um, protectionism, procurement, and other issues in the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, the prior webinars are available on publicprocurementinternational.com. They've got recordings there that are linked to YouTube, and the recordings are in over 100 languages. So please feel free to um, go to publicprocurementinternational.com if you would like to see those earlier webinars. Um, this webinar today is going to be focusing on trade issues and trade restraints that may affect the international response to the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we will have a webinar on Thursday as well. It'll be at 12 noon Eastern time here in the United States. It'll be focusing on U.S. Uh, responses, U.S. federal regulatory responses uh, to the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic in procurement. Um, that webinar is also available on publicprocurementinternational.com, and it's with the National Bar Association, again, at 12 noon on Thursday Eastern time. We're going to go through a quick review of where the pandemic stands internationally. Um, we're going to go through the introductions um, of our panelists, our esteemed panelists, and um, we are also going to be then going through a series of presentations by the panelists and wrapping up as we usually do in these webinars with questions and answers from the audience. First speaking today will be Simon Evanet from the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland. He joined us before. He is a leading international economist studying the impact of trade controls on the COVID-19 procurement, excuse me, on the COVID-19 pandemic. And more broadly, he's well known for the, uh, for the work he's done in assessing trade controls internationally. We're also joined by Rob Anderson, who's an honorary professor at the University of Nottingham. He's a retired member of the WTO Secretariat, where he headed up the efforts on the government procurement agreement. He'll be speaking to the GPA today, as well as will be Gene Heilman Greer, who's from Joggy Consulting in Washington, DC. Um, and Tom McSorley uh, from Arnold and Porter, Washington, DC, will be talking about some export controls that the United States has put in place as examples of export controls that are coming into place in the COVID-19 pandemic. Finally, Zernitsa Kutlina Dimitrova from the European Commission. She will be discussing the uh, ways to measure the impact of trade restraints um, on international procurement flows and some of the developing work that the European Commission is doing in, in assessing. Um, our moderators today are Laurence Foliolario from the University of Paris, Nanterre. She's joining us from Dakar in Senegal. Um, also Vanessa Shera from the National Foreign Trade Council. She's the vice president there. And I'm from GW Law School, so she's here to this is a map of where things stand in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we do this at every webinar, so we have an update of where the hotspots are. As you can see, the hotspots have spread across much of the United States. They're emerging in Africa, They're, of course, across Europe, and China was the original hotspot. And you're, you're seeing some emerging hotspots in Latin America, too. Um, and that's a, a, uh, there's significant political controversy in Brazil right now about uh, the remedial efforts being made there. Um, we'll be talking about these hotspots around the world, and we welcome your questions in the chat space as we go through. We won't be using the question and answer during this webinar. We'll only be using the chat, and my, my fellow panelists and I will be responding to your questions in the chat room. The, the chat and the recording of today's session will both be posted on publicprocurementinternational.com. The slides that we're using here are already posted on that website, publicprocurementinternational.com. This map here is a, a, a current hotspot assessment of where the, where the key hotspots are, where the, where the cases are emerging. And as I mentioned before, Africa is a growing, a growing concern. And I've asked in just a few minutes talking about what the outlook is like for Africa. Laurent? Yes, thank you. Uh, I would like to raise the trade issues and their consequences on public procurement in the uh, African uh, situation. Uh, while the United States, China, and Europe dispute over measures to open or close their exports, Africa is witnessing even more distraught than the former crisis. Last week, Dr. Mukisha Kitwali, Secretary General of MCAD, called for a health marshal for Africa. Indeed, the health crisis through the purchase of COVID supplies is hitting the poorest countries harder. They are clearly under-equipped sometimes with even less than a dozen intensive care beds, and they cannot afford to keep up with the surge in prices 
fueled by competition between the biggest buyers, such as United States, Europe, or Japan. Export restrictions in medical supplies begin to strike. In Senegal, where I live, 90% of the medicines are imported through central purchasing pharmaceutical body. But pharmacies in Dakar are already experiencing empty shelves, and the situation is identical in all sub-Saharan countries. This is even amplified by a negative tariff policy in place in many African countries. For example, personal protective supplies, the PPE, attract uh, MFM tariff of 18% and go as high as 27% in some African countries, which is in sharp contrast with the US where it's just 2.1%. Furthermore, the African continent is facing a multi-layer crisis because it's now fear that the COVID-19 pandemic could have a devastating effect on food security with trade barriers or export bans. For example, Vietnam has already suspended exports of rice. Third, the spread of the disease without sufficient means to cope with it and the extreme poverty of populations without social safety net facing inadequate complete shutdowns are likely to quickly lead to a security crisis. Violent movements are to be feared. If Africa is left without efficient solutions, the boomerang effect could be terrible for developed countries. So this is an explicit example of how trade war could affect millions of people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laurence. Simon, over to you. Thank you, Chris. It's a pleasure to be back. To set the scene for today's discussion, I will describe the form and prevalence of protectionism since the pandemic began. The first uh, point to make is that uh, the most salient forms of trade policy that have been export curbs in selected sectors rather than across the board tariff increases, which we have associated with uh, major economic crises in the past. In fact, the number of tariff increases this year is well down compared to last year, and the number of import restrictions more generally is down as well. So if anything, the action is on the export side, in particular on restricting exports. The second comment to say it relates to the resort to export curbs in the area of medical supplies. And here I mean medical supplies related to COVID-19, medical consumables such as PPE, medical equipment such as medical ventilators, and medicines themselves. The Global Trade Alert team at the University of St. Allen has documented 115 export curbs, which have been taken by 75 governments. And uh, in a, about a minute or so on the next slide, I'll describe for you a bit more detail. But ultimately, we see a lot of action here in restricting uh, the export of uh, needed medicines. And of course, this has knock-on effects in the countries which had been anticipating receiving shipments from abroad. The third comment to make is that in, it's important to balance the discussion of export curbs in medicines uh, medical items with the fact that a large number of governments have actually been liberalizing their import regimes for the same products. Uh, I count that 79 governments have implemented 52 different measures that have liberalized tariffs and non-tariff measures on medical items. Most of the initiatives, I think 41 of the 52, involve tariff elimination and in some case, cases the elimination of sales taxes and of value-added taxes. Now, these uh, actions here then, of course, suggest that there's a mixed picture in trade in uh, medical supplies, both export curbs and import reforms. It's heartening to know that many governments have realized that taxing medical supplies at a time like this makes no sense. The fourth comment to make is that there is a lot of media attention concerning export curbs in food. And now this, of course, can have a serious development significance, and uh, we should uh, watch it carefully, but you may be interested to know, to know that as of last Friday, 25 nations had put in place export curbs of some type, far fewer than the ones with the number we have seen in the area of medical goods. And there's been only one big player which has put in place an, uh, a fairly far-ranging far export ban, and that's Russia. In the case of Vietnam, they did indeed put in place an export ban on wheat, but they've now watered that down to an export quota uh, because of pushback from uh, their farmers. And that's a dynamic we've seen in other countries, including Romania, for example. So these are four uh, key points about 
uh, the dynamics there. Let me move on and provide a bit more detail in the area of medical supplies uh, with the next slide, please, Chris. And uh, this, I think, will help build a link to the procurement matters, which I'm sure uh, some colleagues will want to discuss further. It's important to appreciate when we talk about export curbs for medical supplies that they can that these curbs can take many forms. I, I, we could have a curb which is an outright ban. We can have uh, suasion or jawboning or persuasion of uh, firms, local firms, not to export goods and to divert goods to the local market. We can have governments which issue requisition orders for all of the domestic, all or some of the domestically produced goods. So there's no formal restriction on exports, just a, a requirement that local suppliers must supply uh, the government only, and that includes including breaking uh, contracts, which they may have signed with foreign buyers before. And lastly, uh, there are export authorization schemes, uh, which on the face of it are not formal bans, but they can, they can default and become a ban if the uh, procedures followed are unclear, if the treatment of exporters is uncertain, and if, uh, if firms are uh, told systematically they cannot export. So these are the four types of export curb that one observes. And in the top right, uh, top uh, left-hand corner here, we have a map showing you which governments have implemented which types of uh, bans. And you can see that uh, these bans now have covered uh, a large number of countries, 75 we have here, uh, and uh, they are not all the same in, in nature. We have many export bans, but there are some de facto export bans. There are, of course, some jurisdictions which have implemented multiple export curbs. And so uh, we te we've tended to highlight where the most severe export restriction is in place uh, when that's uh, relevant. So we can see then that there's a substantial number of jurisdictions which have imposed export bans, but there are also um, a number of, of suppliers of medical equipment uh, which have not ex ex imposed export bans on their local manufacturers. And so in the case of medical ventilators, we can see that Australia and Mexico, who are two big suppliers of ventilators, uh, have not supplied export bans. Canada is a smaller supplier, as is Japan of medical ventilators. But the number of suppliers which, um, which uh, can supply the world market is diminishing. And as was noted earlier, some countries are so completely dependent on foreign supply for medical uh, devices and medical consumables. And they, of course, now are scrambling to acquire whatever they can on world markets. And so we can see then on the top left-hand map, uh, the, scare, the, the, the prevalence of these bans. The bottom right-hand map shows you the spread of these uh, export curbs over time. And essentially these curbs have gone, uh, essentially have, they have moved west as the, um, as the, uh, uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has spread west as well. And we can see essentially that March uh, saw an enormous number. I think actually 76 of these 115 bans were imposed in March. So that was a very active uh, period of time. So overall, then we can see this is a, a dynamic which is still unfolding. Uh, last week we saw a, the latest ban was undertaken by Serbia with respect to medicines, and uh, this is a uh, this is a disrupting heavily the, supp uh, the supply of medical uh, goods and services, or mainly goods, uh, to uh, countries which desperately need them. I think I'll just conclude with one last comment, which is to say, in thinking about the impact of export bans, these are often put in place when governments find themselves uh, unprepared for the huge surges in demand, uh, which result from this pandemic. And because of their lack of preparation, they scramble. The use of export bans is a reflexive uh, tool, which they seem to have grabbed, uh, but it does not in any way produce any more export, uh, any more ventilators. It doesn't necessarily save any more lives. All, what, all, the, all we have done here is to deny other countries uh, access to these uh, medical devices and medical supplies. The last observation in that respect is that many medical su uh, supplies these days are produced in international supply chains. And uh, it is uh, naive to think that any one country can go it alone and produce all of uh, the medical supplies it needs for itself. And therefore, almost by construction, we need a collaborative solution in order to scale up production, in order to meet the demand for medical supplies in the first wave, and as was noted earlier, in possible second waves as well. So that uh, is my overview of the current state of protectionism since the pandemic began. Thank you, Chris.
Good morning. So um, I'm going to be speaking about the role of the government procurement agreement, the GPA, in um, limiting, limiting import restrictions in the context of the crisis. And I appreciate com Simon's comment that a lot of the action right now is on the export ban side, and I think that's an important point. Yet maybe in a way, the fact that we've seen, we haven't seen so many new import barriers um, is to some extent a reflection of that we have a good system in place, at least to control that side of things. At any rate, I want to say that international trade in medicines, protective equipment, and other supplies for years has been an important consideration in, ex in ensuring access to health care and robust governmental responses to public health crises around the world. This has actually been talked about extensively, for example, um, as between the, the World Trade Organization and the World Health Organization. There are a number of, there's something called the Trilateral Study, which was published in 2005, which is very germane to this point. There's also something called the International Health Regulations, which are, are intended in part to ensure that um, trade is not unreasonably restricted in the context of uh, public health crises. And this is, all of this is tremendously important because, precisely because viruses and bacteria do not respect international borders. And outbreaks that go unaddressed in neighboring countries, um, you know, gr greatly compound, hugely compound the difficulties of controlling the public health threats at home. This is, this is kind of basic thinking in terms of in the public, international public health community. And furthermore, as and consistent with what Laurence has noted, uh, many countries lack domestic capacity to produce their own goods, supplies, and medicines and have no imminent prospect of gaining such capacity. So for all these reasons, really, the international public health community as well as the international trade community has said that the preservation of open markets in medicines, protective equipment, and other health supplies, you know, is, is, is really important from the international health perspective and the trade perspective. Now, the GPA uh, actually uh, is, is the cornerstone of this, I suggest. At the same time, the GPA does recognize that in times of crisis, Governments do face immense pressures to respond first and foremost to the needs of their own citizens and to be seen as so responding. And there's also legitimate practical needs to expedite the procurement of medicines, medical equipment and so forth. And, uh, the, and you know, in that context, the GPA um, does provide a degree of flexibility, which I'll, I'll get to in just a moment. The first point I want to make, though, is that the GPA, this is the international legal framework to broadly to ensure non-discrimination and transparency in public procurement. This um, is, covers currently 48 WTO member countries, and uh, it, is, it, it has been mo recently modernized and so forth. Um, we, this agreement covers the public health sector to a very significant degree. This is point number one I want to make. So for example, uh, public health entities or entities that carry out health or crisis related procurements are broadly covered by the majority of GPA parties for, and including very much the United States, uh, the European Union, Canada, and so forth. Um, they all, also, in a number of cases, public hospitals, public hospital administrations, and so forth, are also covered. And the GPA applies very much to the procurement of, for example, um, pharmaceutical products, ventilators, gloves, masks, protective gear, more generally. Um, all these things are looked on, upon as goods largely in the GPA context, and they are covered by most, um, most, the majority of GPA parties, unless they are accepted in very limited circumstances. So, and also I can mention just in passing that uh, health services are increasingly covered um, under the GPA 
not uh, not so much as the as the procurement of goods, but um, I think this will grow over time. Okay, so um, so key point, key takeaway: the GPA has broad application in the field of medicines, health-related goods, and services, health-related goods and emergency-related goods, and uh, this. This is a part, this is a core foundation of the international framework, policy framework, to ensure open markets in this sector. Um, now, the flexibilities. So people have heard about the, probably about the exception for uh, public health, protection of human life and health. And this is a broad exclusion, which is, which is there and is an important safety valve and does enable countries to take the measures that are necessary for the protection of human life and health. But the point I want to make, and that's very significant, and that's in a way that the big fallback that countries have. If they deem it necessary, they will um, proceed in the context of the public health exception. But the GPA also contains more nuanced uh, ways in which government can uh, respond to, to a crisis of, of the nature of the COVID-19. And for example, a, a very simple one, which is very uh, widely used, I would say, is uh, greater scope for what we call uh, limited tendering or sole sourcing or direct award contracts in the context of a crisis. Um, it's also possible to shorten the time periods that apply in procurement systems in the context of an urgent situation. And the nice thing about these more nuanced provisions is that uh, the transparency aspect of the GPA is maintained at least to an extent. And so I think that, you know, to the extent that governments can uh, operate within the more nuanced provisions, that's actually a good thing for the whole system because the element of transparency will be there uh, there will be uh, um, residual application of these provisions, which I think is important in terms of maintaining public confidence in the, in the procurement system. So, um, the, uh, so, so, so what we see is we have a system where um, core legal elements are there to protect the openness of markets and to prevent the imposition of of um, new import controls. And these apply to the procurement which is covered by the GPA parties. And in fact, though, we do see that um, there is significant coverage of public health goods and related uh, medicines, uh, ventilators, masks, and so forth. And I think that's really an important part of the framework that we have now. We also have these possibilities to expedite procurement um, in the context of a crisis and governments are certainly using those. And we also, to a degree, and especially as I say, where the more nuanced provisions of the GPA are used, we have the preservation of essential um, transparency elements in the legal framework. So this is, this is the situation as it is. I'm going to go one step further than I would if I were still in my old job in the GPA, in the WTO. Uh, I'm gonna say that I, this is a good and a sensible framework. And I dare say it's even working reasonably well. At least it is helping now to preserve a degree of market openness. It helps to preserve public trust in the procurement system. It will enable appropriate post-crisis audits and monitoring. And we certainly all know that lots of things can go wrong in procurement when we're in a rush. This is the, the classic situation where procurement goes awry. And so to, as far as possible, we should be trying to keep track of things, uh, not rush excessively, keep a, maintain a public record. Um, this is also, the system we have is also consistent with the principle that where public policy objectives are pursued in, in departure from normal GPA rules, it should be done in as trade-friendly a way 
as possible. And uh, this, this, I think, is, you know, all of this, I think, is important because um, trade, uh, public health crises are unpredictable. We don't know where the next one is. It's not, so we can't just say, oh, you know, it, had we known in advance, magically, we might have two years ago started, you know, stockpiling, stockpiling masks and stockpiling ventilators and, ventilators and so forth. But we actually don't know by definition what the next public health crisis will be. So it's not actually good economic planning to stockpile the things from the, from the recent crisis. Rather, we want to keep an, a robust open system so we can all take advantage of advances and innovation that takes place in each other's markets. Thanks very much. Thank you, Rob. I'll pass it over to Jean Greer. Welcome, Jean. Um, thank you, Chris. Uh, let me just start with just a really quick overview of the U.S. procurement system in terms of, of international agreements. The U.S., as many people know, have, or most everyone knows, has numerous uh, by American and domestic preference laws. Um, it waives two of them, the most important of which is the Buy American Act. But for all the other Buy American requirements and domestic preferences, it excludes the procurement from its trade obligations. Um, it has an important uh, restriction on foreign sourcing from countries who are not parties to the GPA or to free trade agreements. And it basically it prohibits federal agencies from buying from those, those from, excuse me, from those countries um, except uh, unless there's a certain exception. So any country that's not a, a party to the GPA, um, such as China or other, or a free trade agreement cannot sell to the US government in most cases. Now there's, the, the, the US just took a temporary measure to lift the prohibition um, in response to some of the needs for the COVID-19 uh, products. And on April 3rd, the General Services Administration issued what's called a non-availability determination, in which they said that the, there's insufficient uh, products from domestic sources and from GPA and FTA partners. So it was opening up the procurement of masks, um, personal uh, protective equipment, and other products needed to fight the pandemic to any country. Um, I've discussed this in my blog, and so if you want to look at it for further discussion, please do. Um, now, let me just address the possibility of the U.S. taking more stringent measures. Um, we've, and I'm going to focus just on the procurement side. One of the dis issues that's been discussed is the possibility of imposing a Buy American uh, requirements on medical goods and pharmaceutical products. And this has been discussed um, and has obviously had quite high level discussion within the White House and even in the U.S. Trade Representative's office. So I think it's a real possibility. The, the sense is it probably wouldn't happen until after the you know, pandemic is over. But I think this recent de determination of non-availability of products from domestic and trade agreement sources would lend itself to saying that, in fact, the U.S. should do something for those who think that we should tighten up our, our um, requirements. Now, if the U.S. were to impose uh, new restrictions on purchases of drugs and medical products, um, this would go contrary to its requirements under the, both the GPA and its free trade agreements. Because under those agreements, the U.S. covers the, the principal agencies that would be doing the procuring, such as the health and well, Health and Human Services Department, Veterans Affairs, and the Defense Department. And also for these products, there's no, the U.S. has not taken any exceptions for them or any exclusions. So to suddenly say we're going to impose new Buy American requirements uh, could, impose, could be problematic in terms of its, compl its compliance with these agreements. Now, Rob mentioned the, the provision, the exception, the GPA that allows for, for countries to take measures that are um, for the protection of health and, and safety. The U.S. perhaps could argue that that would cover some Buy American requirements, but I think that's, that's quite questionable. Um, so then the question would be, if the U.S. were to propose it, how might they do it? 
Now, the legal a, a, a approach under the GPA would be to notify parties that they were going to take these restrictions and to offer compensation, which means additional procurement or some other measures to compensate for the loss of, 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 of the, of the um, access to that procurement, or it would face retaliation. Now, the U.S. obviously could impose such measures and say we're going to not apply them to our GPA parties, partners. In recent um, measures, laws, particularly the 2009 um, stimulus package, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, it imposed a significant um, Buy American requirement on infrastructure projects, but it was done, it was directed to do so in a way that was not that was consistent with, its with our trade obligations, which meant we excluded our trading partners from those restrictions. So that would be another, uh, another approach that could be taken. Um, but let me talk for a minute about if they face retaliation. And I think I'm going to just segue this into the discussion on the possibility of the U.S. withdrawing from the GPA, because I think the same issues apply. You know, there's been discussion over the past few weeks, months, that the U.S. could pull out of the WTO procurement agreement. Um, how likely that is, um, who knows? Um, it seems to have receded in terms of recent discussions, but that doesn't mean it's gone away. Um, but what this could mean is if the U.S. pulled out of the GPA, um, it, would create, it could create an imbalance because the U.S. could pull out and it would close its market um, sort of immediately, it could close its market immediately to its foreign um, competitors or foreign partners. Um, the Trade Agreements Act prohibits purchases from any country that's not a GPA or FTA partner. So the U.S. could, you know, could just close down its market to all or any countries that it wanted to. But I think the important thing for the international community is to look at how could or how would other countries respond. Because most countries, and I would say very few to the contrary, do not have in place measures that would allow them to take action to quickly close their markets. Now, some have the authority, and I think some member states in the EU have the authority to take actions in this regard, but the question is, would they? But I think most GPA parties don't have this kind of measure in place. So you could have the situation where the US has closed its market to foreign suppliers, but it in fact is still able to participate in the other countries' um, procurement markets. Um, the EU has considered, and it's, I think is still considering an international procurement instrument, which would allow it to take action in such cases. Um, but that's been under discussion for some time. And it's a question whether that would be, um, we would provide even if adopted as currently designed, a quick response. Um, so I think this goes to the whole question of if the US either put in place a Buy American uh, executive or, or executive order that, that uh, put a Buy American requirements in place for medical and pharmaceutical products or withdrew from the GPA, how would other countries respond? And I, it's my, my sense that most countries are not in the position in their own legal systems to take action that would really effectively counter that kind of move quickly. Thank you, Chris. Thanks very much, Shane. That's very interesting. Tom, the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit here about the export side of things uh, in the U.S. Uh, and where we are uh, and what uh, new actions the U.S. has taken uh, on the export side. Simon alluded uh, to the U.S. having taken some action, and that's true, and I'll get there in a moment. But first, I thought it would be helpful to describe the, the existing export control regime uh, before the pandemic. Uh, and for that, there are essentially three legs to that stool. Uh, the U.S. has uh, arms uh, restrictions, restrictions on the export of, uh, of arms, which we won't talk about, not relevant here. And then there's also a regime uh, called the Export Administration Regulations, which is the U.S. dual use uh, export control regime. But that also covers much more than, than what many countries think of as dual use technology. Uh, it even has some restrictions for some countries on uh, basic goods, you know, pencils, chairs, uh, books, uh, in some cases. Um, uh, and then finally, there are special sanctions and embargoes administered by the Treasury Department uh, on a handful of countries, including, as the slide says, uh, Iran and Syria. And obviously, Iran has uh, 
uh, been in the press on this front because of the significant uh, outbreak uh, in Iran. So first, before we talk about the export restrictions that have put in place, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about at least some ostensibly um, uh, good news or, or helpful news or, or uh, something positive. And, and that is for now, uh, it is still okay. Uh, there are no new restrictions and there, there aren't really any existing restrictions for most the export of most uh, medicine and medical devices from the U.S. to essentially anywhere in the world. Uh, there are more stringent requirements uh, for certain countries, um, but in general, the U.S. has uh, adopted the policy of uh, permitting the export of most medicine and medical devices globally, uh, and also food, uh, which obviously may become relevant as the pandemic drags on, and it's already becoming relevant in many places. Um, there was in fact, some uncertainty with respect to medical research, whether uh, elements of the, the SARS-CoV-2, the COVID-19 virus, whether there would be problems in the research community with exporting elements of the virus um, around the world or uh, research elements of the virus or potentially vaccines, because there are heightened restrictions on certain kinds of vaccines uh, but in fact, the Commerce Department, which administers our dual use regulations, put out guidance saying that there aren't any heightened restrictions on on the virus itself or on um, uh, research uh, elements uh, of the virus. So that's all uh, good news. Um, uh, other good news here is that for uh, significantly sanctioned countries, including Iran and Syria, uh, Venezuela, Cuba, and a few other places, the Treasury Department, which administers those embargoes, has put out guidance um, saying that basically emphasizing the exemptions that are already in place, and there are a significant number of them, that uh, exports for humanitarian purposes, that exports of medicine and medical devices, uh, uh, et cetera, are, you know, continue to be authorized, that there are, there are no new restrictions, and furthermore, that the Treasury Department will entertain on a favorable basis uh, any applications by U.S. parties uh, to do additional humanitarian work or pandemic response work uh, in these countries, even if there isn't an existing exemption. Uh, just on Friday, the director of the office that administers uh, sanctions and embargoes made a, a fairly strong statement that they would prioritize uh, new applications for humanitarian work in response to the crisis. So um, that, that is the, the positive angle on where we are on export controls. Essentially, uh, under the existing export control regimes that I just discussed, there actually aren't any new restrictions, and uh, the government is emphasizing what is still permissible uh, around the world, including with respect to medicine and medical devices. So that brings us to uh, what Simon alluded to, what are the new export restrictions that have been put in place in the United States? And here, I think it's important to understand not only what those new restrictions are, but where they're coming from. So for now, the, the uh, only, and, and I understand that it's a significant one, but the only new export restriction currently in place is on the export of PPE. So respirator, masks, other uh, filtering respirators, filters, and then also standard surgical masks and gloves. So significant export restriction given the supply chain in the United States. Uh, but, uh, but where is it coming from? Um, so unlike the export restrictions I just talked about, there is a separate law called the Defense Production Act or the DPA. Uh, that's a very powerful law that was passed in uh, 1950 to give the president additional authorities uh, during times of uh, war to support national defense or in times of emergency to uh, basically take control of parts of the US supply chain. The law does a number of other things that are not relevant here, but relevant for our purposes, uh, the law has two important authorities that it gives the, the president and by extension, the US federal government. The first authority is that the president can issue what are called rated orders. And this means that the federal government can basically knock on the door of any U.S. business uh, and uh, place an order for what that business makes and demand that the, the company uh, fulfill that order first. And this is an important authority because even though it's not, um, it's not an export ban, and this is not, by the way, the way the government has implemented the PPE ban, which I'll talk about in a moment, 
But this authority to issue these rated orders can have a significant distorting effect uh, on the supply chain and on exports, because obviously, if the government knocks on the door of a company and says, you've got to fulfill my order first uh, and, and hand it over to the federal government, uh, if the government orders you know, the capacity uh, of that company to produce an item or even a significant amount of whatever item the company is producing, that's going to diminish uh, the supply uh, that the company can provide to other domestic customers and, and, and to customers outside the U.S. So this rated order authority is something that the federal government actually uses frequently in the defense context. It's, it's a brand new context uh, here to use it for uh, medical supplies, uh, and other pandemic response, but but so far we we have seen the government uh, say they're going to use it, or in some cases uh, use it uh, uh, potentially for ventilators, uh, and also most recently for uh, testing swabs, the long uh, nasal swabs that are needed uh, to conduct COVID testing. So the first element of the DPA that's important to understand is the rated order authority. The second authority, and this is where the export ban comes in, is uh, what's called the allocations authority under the DPA. And the allocations authority, unlike the rated order authority, is rarely used. Um, uh, in fact, I'm not sure that it's been used, on, certainly at this scale or for the significance since the DPA was passed. And the allocations authority is a, uh, it's only a few words, frankly, in the Defense Production Act, but it has major implications. Uh, it, it essentially says that uh, the, the president in, in, in emergencies or for the national defense has the authority to allocate materials, uh, services, and facilities. And it goes on to say that the president can allocate uh, material services and facilities even in the civilian market where there's a scarcity. And it's under this second uh, branch of the DPA, this allocation authority, that the president has issued an order uh, saying that uh, PPE in the United States needs to be allocated for domestic use. Uh, and, and as a result, the uh, Federal Emergency Management Administration, or FEMA, has issued rules uh, that, that in turn uh, order the border agents to uh, seize uh, exports of PPE uh, take a look at what they are, and then, um, uh, based on a, a number of criteria, decide whether the uh, the shipment should actually be turned back to the United States for domestic use. So this is a brand new way of doing export controls in the United States. This is not the kind of export control uh, export practitioners are used to dealing with, and it's a shifting situation on the ground. Uh, in fact, there are a few new exemptions. There was uh, a, a, a one limited exemption in the FEMA rule when it came out, um, the border uh, agency, the Customs and Border Protection, actually issued an internal guidance document that, that provides a number of other exemptions. And then this morning, uh, FEMA has issued a number of additional exemptions under this rule. So this is a very shifting uh, situation. Uh, there are some helpful exemptions to, to go back to the point I made earlier about uh, uh, humanitarian work. The the FEMA rule uh, issued today does exempt uh, exports of, of PPE by nonprofit or NGOs uh, solely for donation to foreign charities or governments. Um, so so there, there is a humanitarian exemption in addition to uh, a number of other exemptions to this, this, uh, this new rule. But this is a brand new way of doing export controls, and it's one that comes under a fairly untested and broad presidential authority. So. Uh, the dynamics here are are changing quickly, and it's it's also unclear where this will go. Uh, Vanessa, in our uh, prep session earlier uh, or yesterday, uh, mentioned the possibility that, that thermometers may actually be a, a, an item uh, next on the list of being added to this kind of um, this kind of export restriction. So, um, so this this. Uh, export ban is, is uh, it's, it's shifting, it's hot off the presses. What, what are the takeaways uh, from all I've just talked about? So first, I want to say that as I, you know, because this is a new kind of export control uh, and the rules are shifting daily and the president is releasing uh, guidance um, frequently, there's a dynamic of uncertainty here that makes it difficult to predict where we'll be, uh, you know, in a week or two. And in fact, when Chris invited me to participate uh, in this probably at the beginning of uh, April, 
most of this was was not in place. In fact, I don't think the export ban was in place yet when we first talked about this panel. So I, I said then, uh, and you know, I, I wonder what I'll be talking about in two weeks. And indeed, this is not what I knew I'd be talking about. So in two weeks, we don't know where we'll be. Uh, second, uh, I think it's important again to reiterate that regardless of what the law says, or regardless of whether there are you know export bans in, in place or new export rules, the demand in the United States is so significant that I think you're going to see a reduction in, in supply coming from the United States simply because there's overwhelming demand here and there's obviously significant uh, non-legal pressure on companies to supply domestically. So that's an important uh, you know, soft export problem uh, uh, in the United States. And then finally, I, I want to say that the politics here are, are messy and somewhat conflicting. So I think everybody understands, or, or if you're following <laughs> along, um, you understand that the Trump administration, and as this discussion has already revealed, uh, generally has a loud policy of, of you know, quote unquote, America first. Uh, that's something they've been very uh, vocal about. Uh, and that obviously creates difficult dynamics in the pandemic. At the same time, there have been elements of the Trump administration that have been noisy about needing to maintain uh, the free market. Here. And, and so there's been resistance by the Trump administration to use uh, command authority to take control of uh, the pandemic response at a national level. And so while there is this America first instinct, there also seems to be at least some uh, pressure in the administration not to use the Defense Production Act as much as, as others would like to use. And then what's interesting is the opposition party, the, the Democrats, which generally are seen is more in favor of global collaboration, of, of, uh, of working together, of humanitarian intervention. Uh, at the same time, the Democrats have been very vocal about wanting the Trump administration to take a more uh, vocal, uh, a more command uh, uh, of the pandemic response in the United States and to use the Defense Production Act um, more aggressively. And so there are sort of uh, conflicting uh, pressures in both political parties. Uh, and between both the Trump administration and, and the opposition here that, um, again, add to this level of unpredictability about where, where we'll be in the months ahead. ahead. Um, so uh, that's, unfortunately, I don't know if I, <laughs> I guess my message is we have to stay tuned uh, on the export front. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Tom. I'm gonna pass it over to Zornitsa. Sorry. You're... Hello. There you are. Yeah, perfect. Uh, hello, Chris, and hello, everyone. And first of all, many thanks uh, for inviting me to speak uh, at uh, this very distinguished panel. Um, it's an honor to be here. My intervention uh, will focus on the importance of data and analysis in respect to COVID-19 related measures, but not only to that. It would be also generally uh, precisely targeted at the importance of data in the field of international procurement. Now, what we know from the facts, and uh, I'm very glad that we had uh, Simon's intervention uh, at the panel showing us uh, the various uh, trade restrictive measures uh, governments uh, have taken in respect to COVID-related equipment. Um, I was um, satisfied to hear that there have been also quite some trade liberalizing measures, but, but the amount of uh, trade restrictive measures is of course um, enormous, especially in respect to export restrictions. Now, this trend we observe uh, in the current uh, crisis also applies to protectionism in public procurement in general. And um, there is a sound evidence, uh, we have published a couple of papers on that, also using the data from the Global Trade Alert database. Uh, Simon and uh, his team have been uh, putting up and maintaining for several years now that um, governments has resorted to uh, various uh, trade restrictive, uh, restrictive measures in the field of uh, government procurement. Now, this is a bad news actually because uh, a recent economic research shows that there are sizable economic benefits uh, to be reaped uh, 
uh, for all participating uh, parties in uh, government procurement uh, liberalization. And um, I can uh, name, for example, my own research on um, the impact of extending the scope and the coverage of the government procurement agreement, which shows that if parties would engage into a further liberalizing uh, their commitments uh, within the GPA, this would, have, uh, this would lead to sizable economic gains in terms of trade and economic welfare. There is also recent uh, research, uh, it's also economic modeling paper by, by Peter Dixon and co-authors. Uh, they look at the impact of eliminating by local provisions in the US and also they have uh, provided a very sound evidence that by doing so, um, the US will gain uh, tremendously in terms of job creation, but also in terms of um, GDP gains. Now, all this research have been only possible because we have invested recently quite a lot in um, building up our modeling capacity targeted at assessing um, government procurement uh, measures in general. However, this is the field which uh, exhibits, um, I would say, one of the biggest gaps in terms of data in international trade. We have a wonderful um, tariff data but we know very little about uh, trade restrictive measures in government procurement at the uh, international level and let alone talk about a detailed uh, micro level um, contracts uh, data. Now I'm going to say a couple of words about the data because I think this is key in order to be able to provide uh, evidence based assessment of, for example, of COVID-related uh, uh, trade restrictions, how they would affect the prices and economic welfare, but also in general on the impact of uh, liberalizing government procurement markets, be, a, be as in the framework of the GPA or in bilateral free trade agreements. So um, what we have been trying to obtain, and uh, here I would like to very briefly introduce an initiative, a Digitrade, um, has uh, taken and has commissioned recently to uh, build up a global procurement database. Um, this project, which ran for four years, has been recently completed by the end of uh, 2019. And we have a, now a database which covers uh, very detailed uh, data at uh, contract award level and also the corresponding barriers uh, those uh, uh, government procurement purchases may face in, in various uh, government procurement parties. Now, what is so special about uh, this database and why I think the data which has been acquired could be very helpful in the current situation, but, but also in general, again, in respect to any assessment of um, um, trade measures in the field of international procurement is the fact that we cover uh, all the three procurement modalities. So basically we have collected data in an unprecedented manner uh, for nine uh, key uh, partners, EU partners. And we have managed to look into all the procurement um, avenues through which foreign companies could participate in a foreign bid. And here, very briefly, I'm going to mention those three avenues because I think that uh, the international community has focused uh, a lot on only on the one of those avenues. And basically, the two other modalities uh, have been have remained largely uh, unnoticed or at least not in the center of the debate. So what we call this uh, three procurement mode is first the direct cross-border sales, which is a shipping, uh, for example, COVID-19 related products directly from one country to another and winning a tender from one country to another. And this procurement modality actually accounts for, for a, the, 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 the little, for, for the smallest share in terms of the total foreign procurement in a country. The other uh, very important uh, procurement modality, which actually we think is the most important one, is the procurement which is uh, carried out uh, by uh, local subsidiaries. For example, it could be an European-based uh, uh, foreign affiliate in the US, which um, actually bids and uh, wins a bid uh, 
and supplies the goods and services uh, to the government authorities uh, locally. But this uh, firm has, has a foreign owner. This is what we call modality two or procurement through local subsidiaries. And what we know from the data and from the projects I have been working so far on that this is, a, this is actually the biggest chunk of foreign procurement which takes place. Also because government authorities are risk averse and they prefer to, to, to buy um, goods and services often uh, locally. And then the third modality which should also not be underestimated in any assessment related to foreign procurement and to uh, liberalizing procurement measures is the modality three or the procurement along the value added uh, uh, supply chain. Uh, what it meant by that is, for example, it could be a domestically owned company which is located domestically. However, when this company wins a bit, it subcontracts a large part of the tender value to a third country firm which means, of course, that this is no longer a purely domestic bit. And what we also know from the data so far, which we have obtained, so this is really based on the facts uh, we have, is that also this modality is the second most important one. And the share of subcontracting um, in this modality is not as large as we thought, because the largest chunk from that modality actually comes from uh, imports. So, every domestic company or the majority of the domestic company needs to source uh, foreign imports in order to uh, provide the goods and services uh, to government um, authorities. Now something uh, also very, very important linked to this database and uh, why, because without this second part, I don't think we can do a proper assessment of the impact of, uh, again, COVID-related measures or um, public procurement measures in general, is the, um, the availability of a repository on the barriers site. What it meant by that is that we have to know not only uh, how much governments procure from abroad and what type of goods and services they procure and a lot and what government procurement level, but we should also know what are the barriers those um, flows or those purchases are facing. And also in that database, we have um, done, um, well, quite a lot uh, in this respect. We have collected those barriers in all these countries. And here I uh, have to add that we have collected not only the legally binding and uh, enshrined in national legislation measures, but also implicit trade barriers. And this was a very important key additional contribution um, of the project because um, what we know is that from the companies, we have also surveyed those companies that often implicit barriers are actually more detrimental to international uh, procurement than explicit barriers which are uh, enshrined in national legislation and which are trans at least transparent in a way because they are there, they, they can be easily um, determined and at least uh, identified. So now, um, just to a little bit to wrap up, um, the importance of this uh, database, um, I think uh, in terms of analytical purposes and for any evidence-based assessment of protectionist measures is tremendous because it, it enables us to to analyze the impact of a given barrier on whatever uh, macroeconomic uh, or microeconomic variable we are interested in. Now, this is uh, in a way, although very successful attempt, it's a partial attempt because it covers um, nine countries. And uh, of course, much more is needed uh, in order to move towards um, a global public procurement database. In this respect, um, the World Bank is also doing its part and they have uh, engaged also a lot to try to uh, bridge also this gap. So um, there is quite some um, um, initiative at the international level and I can only encourage a further effort in this area because of course, um, if we could uh, uh, join efforts and uh, fill in this uh, crucial gap, this would be very important uh, for the international community.
Um, what is um, also very, very important in this uh, context is the fact that we have uh, used an internationally recognized methodology, so it would be easy actually for other um, countries uh, to join because the criteria for creating the database uh, are clear and are clearly set and documented so that it would be a low um, a low cost uh, in order to engage in this um, international comparative um, exercise. And by this, I would like to conclude that um, building up the data uh, in order to be able to assess very thoroughly and carefully the impact of COVID-19 related measure, but also of international uh, procurement measure, uh, measures in general, it's a key. And um, what I can also say and what we learned from the, this uh, huge exercise was that um, we would even like to go further because the level of this aggregation, um, it's a pretty much at a CPV code uh, in the European uh, language. So this is the common procurement vocabulary, but it would be uh, important for a future efforts, especially in respect to the COVID-19 related measures to have even more disaggregated data so that we can um, extend the analysis at uh, even more um, COVID products uh, related level. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Lenitsa. So uh, we're gonna go just a few minutes or over. And first I'd like to ask Vanessa, if she'd like to say a few words. Vanessa and I have known each other for 30 years. And anytime she says anything, it's very interesting. So I very much hope she can contribute to our discussion this morning. Thanks, Chris. Um, I don't have a lot to add because this has been a fabulous set of panelists. Um, I guess my comment is more a political one um, because I do trade policy analysis. Um, less as an economist and more as a political person. But I would say that um, the, clearly we're going to need an international sort of discussion about how to deal with medical supplies and how to deal with the proliferation of export restrictions and um, potentially tariffs, um, depending on how things go. So I think the question is, how is the international conversation going to be conducted? And is there an international institution that will serve as the host for that discussion? Um, I know there have been many different um, people have put forth different ideas about that. Um, I applaud the ideas put forward by the Europeans and the Australians, um, Singapore, and others have tried to come up with ideas for how this would be um, deployed, how, how, how we would get a conversation started. I, I fear that there will be a lack of U.S. leadership here, as Tom has pointed out. Um, we have an administration that has been speaking in different, um, different sort of aspects of this, but it's troubling that the U.S., historically a leader in trade and international uh, institution building has, has, has been very absent in a lot of these discussions. So the question I think that all of this poses is how does the international discussion move forward and who steps in to take the lead? Um, I think, as I said, we can expect there will be an absence of U.S. leadership in the short term. And then the question becomes um, who, who starts to drive the consensus building. So that's my comment for the moment. Thanks very much, Vanessa. Uh, we have a very distinguished guest here this morning, and I'm, um, Rob, I wonder if you could introduce him. Thanks very much, Chris, gladly. So it's my honor and pleasure to introduce to the webinar uh, Bonifacio Garcia Porras, or Bonnie, as we all know him. Uh, Bonnie is the lead official and senior negotiator for the entire European Union in the WTO Committee on Government Procurement. And he's, in that respect, he's a very seasoned hand in both Geneva and in Brussels. Uh, he's also a dear friend from my time in Geneva. So Bonnie, I think you are now, um, you've been promoted to a, per, to a speaker position as, as Chris says, and uh, the floor is yours. You may need to unmute yourself before you start speaking. I, think it's I hope he's fine. I hope it's fine. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes. And Perfect. we can see you. Good, good afternoon to everybody. Thanks, uh, uh, Chris. And, and thanks, Rob. It's really a pressure to, to see you here and listen to you to this terrific, uh, fantastic uh, webinar. I think I wish you uh, well and good health and those who may have been affected swift and full recovery. Um, I think in the context of the coronavirus, 
uh, crisis, the objective of the European Commission has been to save people's lives. Uh, the protections of our citizens is our first priority. While member states are in the front line, the Commission plays a key coordinating and role. The Commission has taken public health measures. It has been working with member states to ensure the flow of essential goods uh, across um, borders. The Commission has also taken socioeconomic measures and has provided as well a, a global response uh, to the COVID-19 crisis based on a Team Europe approach. Finally, we are also working in fighting this information. Uh, with regards to the government procurement uh, agreement, um, I think I would like to make some uh, comments, or some suggestions also on, on, on the way forward, particularly thinking about the economic crisis that we may all face in the future that uh, has been partially addressed in the context of this seminar, but I think it's also important that we should be looking at, at it. Um, I mean, the unprecedented character of the current crisis has been recognized, as well as the economic crisis that will follow the health crisis. In that light, I think it's fair to say that we all may face temptations uh, to close our respective uh, markets uh, to address short-term challenges. However, the crisis has also uh, shown our global interdependence and the need for a well-functioning value chain, as has also been mentioned before. Um, but at the same time, I think this shows uh, the need for openness and cooperation to face global challenges. I think no country no territory in the European, in the, in the world can overcome this crisis alone. I think we need to draw on each other's comparative advantages, engage in mutually beneficial trade, resist temptations uh, of national autarky, and procure critical supplies from where they can be most effectively secure. Uh, in, this, in this context, uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, the European Union will champion open, transparent, and non-discriminatory government procurement, as well as meaningful market opening based on reciprocity. But what can we do uh, concretely? I think a first and critical step in ensuring transparency, uh, a first critical step is certainly ensuring transparency. And I think the European Union fully supports the WTO efforts and leadership in ensuring transparency about the members. Uh, trade-related response measures to the crisis. In a second step, and as I said before by the previous speaker, I think we need to discuss on what more the WTO and the GPA, for instance, can do to become instrumental to the economic recovery effort. So three concrete objectives in my view, transparency, international exchange of good practice, and mutual learning. In the context of, of GPA, I think, uh, I would like to share with my colleagues in, in Geneva, as soon as we have the opportunity to, to meet or to virtually meet, uh, some, some reflections and some possibilities. Let's use, for instance, the, the work that we are currently using, uh, doing in the context of the work programs uh, under the GPA to address some of these issues. For instance, there is a work program on SMEs. As part of the economic recovery, notably SMEs, will need economic opportunities. They will need meaningful access to public contracts in their respective countries, but also abroad. Uh, how do we ensure that they do have this access, but in a way that is not certainly uh, discriminatory or contrary to the principles of, of the GPA? For instance, uh, statistics. We also have a working program on a statistic. And as I said, as I said before by my uh, colleagues of NISA, I think we need effective policy interventions and this requires solid evidence base. But there is another one, a third one, which is, for instance, how to integrate sustainability in government procurement in a non-discriminatory manner. So indeed, the massive investments needed during the exit from the crisis can be, I think, important catalyst to the green social and digital transformation our world originally needs. And this has to be done in a non-discriminatory manner. I think my team from the European Union and myself will be happy to share this shared experience, to look forward uh, for, for discussions with other colleagues from, with other parties in the GPA. 
And the last, the last thing to mention is that uh, just to draw your attention on the recently published new guidance on using the public procurement framework in the emergency situation related to COVID-19 crisis, which is using some of the possibilities that Rob was mentioning before. I think he was mentioning a sort of a, a, a more nuanced approach to, to address some of these challenges. That we have. So I, I want to leave it there. And once again, thank you for allowing me to, to address you these, these comments. Thank you. Thank you, Barney. It's very, very useful. Appreciate it. Um, I want to just close with this question. Um, and, and as folks who've been participating in our webinars have, have noted, uh, that over time, we're entering now a second phase of the pandemic. Many countries, for instance, um, New York State, a couple of days ago, went over its peak. Um, the state where I am in Delaware yesterday went over its peak in the pandemic. So states, countries are going over their peak and they'll have less need for critical medical supplies. For example, New York will be sharing its ventilators with, with Maryland and with uh, Michigan. Uh, the question is for the panel is now that we're entering this next phase and hotspots are emerging in other countries around the world, there's an emerging question. How will we move critical supplies from countries that have passed the peak to other countries such as those in Africa and Latin America that are only just now beginning to experience a pandemic in full force? Put differently, is there a way to measure the cost in human lives from these types of export controls we've been discussing. And if there's no way to measure the cost in human lives, should that unmeasurability itself affect the policy discussion? I'll leave that to the, 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 the uh, panel to discuss. Bob, what do you think? So, <laughs> thanks, this is when I get to be a Chris. professor. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, well, uh, and looking at the questions you have on the, on the screen, I mean, do existing import and export restraints take into account impacts on public health domestically and globally? I would say only in a very partial and incomplete way. And uh, it's uh, as several speakers have said, it's terribly important that we develop better data and better analysis and understanding of the public health impacts of these measures as well as the economic impact of these measures. That said, we've made actually huge progress in the last five years, thanks to Zornitsa and Simon and others. Um, how might international agreements help well, uh, I've long felt and am now able to say that we can, we should kind of embrace and promote the GPA more broadly and effectively than we do. And over time, we should be deepening countries' commitments and further expanding the membership of the, of the GPA. Um, a, a very challenging question for the future uh, which has yet to be broached in any kind of official context is uh, when can the international agreements ever seek to uh, address also the export restraint side? I think, um, and this, this is kind of uncharted territory largely, at least in the GPA context. And I think, I think at some stage it will be important to address that element as well. And final comment, actually, and I, I think uh, I think Bonnie said this, and uh, it's a very very important point, uh, and that is that uh, as the good Lord willing, when we get through the pandemic itself, we will then have to address the economic crisis, which will be broad and deep. And in that context, it will be very very important to prevent a new wave of uh, protectionism and import controls, I would say, particularly in that context. And uh, that's, you know, going to be, as it was in the 1930s, it will be very important to 
to avoid that new wave of protectionism and the pressure will be there. So that's, that's a big part of the challenge ahead as well. Thank you very much. With that, unfortunately, we're out of time. I very much appreciate the, the panel's participation. Uh, thank you very much to all the participants who joined us today. And as I noted before, this program will be available in a recording within the next couple hours on publicprocurementinternational.com. Thank you all and have a great day. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Chris and others. Thank you. Thank you.